not that complicated. Good evening, New Hope. It's good to see you tonight. Welcome to Hope on the Hill. Welcome to Wednesday night. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Want to remind you of a couple things coming up. This Saturday is the ladies' shopping trip to Canton. So if you are a lady and you're looking forward to that, I invite you to add your name to the sign-up list on the back table. It looks like the ladies' ministry leader is doing that herself. She should probably get her name on the list. That'd be a good idea. Oh, okay. So uh, are you pulling a trailer also, just in case? Oh, so, uh, but anyway, if you would like to uh, participate in that, uh, sign up or at least communicate with Miss Pat. Let her know if you want to ride the van or carpool or whatever on the trip to Canton and uh, ask your husband for the credit card or whatever it is that you need to do there. <laughs> is that right? Oh my goodness, they got you. So, uh, anyway, uh, ladies shopping trip on, on Saturday, so keep that in mind. The following Saturday, October the 10th, we have two, two things going on on that day. One is 8.30 in the morning. If you can meet over on Pops Landing Road, uh, some of the guys have been working on a local missions uh, effort this summer helping uh, a widow lady with some restoration from some storm damage at her house and so uh, now they've got some effort underway cleaning up the yard and so if you can help with that uh, the address of the, the location will be in the bulletin on Sunday you can also see brother Tony for more details about it but helping out with yard cleanup over there and then at 4 p.m., is that right, is a baby shower for Ryan Hoeing. And so those two things coming up October the 10th. And then, of course, the end of October, we're planning now for our Fall Fest that we'll have on the back parking lot out here. And so in anticipation of that or uh, in conjunction with that, we we'll also invite you to get a New Hope t-shirt. And so... Um, uh, those are prepaid, $12 for a short sleeve New Hope shirt, $15 for a long sleeve shirt. If you want to pay and put in your order tonight, you can see Miss Kristen, and she'll take care of that tonight. Otherwise, on Sunday mornings, you can visit the crew table and put in your order for a T-shirt. Uh, but we invite you to do that and get a New Hope shirt. Uh, you can get, that, go, get those in pretty much any size for the little kids up to uh, man size. You wanna get one my size. So I um, uh, invite you to get a t-shirt, a short sleeve or long sleeve shirt. So uh, uh, anything else that I've forgotten anybody wants me to mention? Yes, ma'am? Uh, light gray. So. Yeah, so, uh, and, and along with the Fall Fest, uh, we need donations of individually wrapped candy, lots of candy. Some of it has started to trickle in, but if you can make donations of candy, we give away a lot of candy. And on that morning, the morning of Saturday the 31st, that's the day of the Fall Fest, uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. But 10 o'clock that morning, we can use your help setting up because we'll get all of our games and everything that we need out of storage and get it out here and get everything set up. So we invite you to help us out with that. And there's something else on that list. Um, we got the dog kennel thing taken care of. Oh, the cakewalk, that's right. If you'd like to make a cake for the cakewalk, you can make a cake and bring it Saturday morning or bring it sometime Saturday before the event uh, for the cakewalk. Yes, sir?
No, we're not having trunk or treat because that would that would be uh, like four days before the fall fest. So, uh, so we'd kind of be doubling up right there. So, uh, so we're going to concentrate all our all of our efforts on the fall fest on uh, Saturday the thirty first. So. Uh, All right. Um, well, that's all right, Miss Pat. You want to come to the piano? Okay. Well, then I'm not going to do I'm not going to do that song. Um, Cause, pardon? Yeah, we probably can't do that either. Um, Cause. Um, that song would probably be better done with the piano. So, um, okay, then if you can get your songbook and turn to song number one. Song number one in your songbook. And if you'd like to stand, you can just stand normal or you can stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. All right, song number one, let's sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In pity angels beheld him and made him from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with a ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see, will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song 
shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good afternoon. Midweek service, and uh, is yes, yeah, good to see you again for about the third time, or fourth time, or how many ever times. Getting to be a regular around here. Um, so uh, we had a lot going on, a lot to pray about. So uh, any prayer requests tonight as we get started? Yes, sir, Brother Kelvin. Yes, pray for Miss Sandra. That is a just can be discouraging and and on top of being sick, so pray for Miss Sandra that they'll be able to figure out what's going on, that God just intervenes in that regard. Good to see Miss Kim back in fighting condition. So that is a blessing. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. She's doing well. Okay, so no, she doesn't have to do any more treatments or anything? Wow. Awesome, wow. Well, that is a blessing. We're going to count that as a victory. And uh, so thank the Lord for that. That is a praise. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Meyer. Pray for Bart and, and just what has been going on in his uh, in his health and but uh, especially for his salvation for sure. Miss Diane, unspoken. unspoken. Any and Nick, I'll uh, Miss Diane. You got the unspoken's out of order. Now everybody wants to do unspoken's and I don't know the difference between a spoken and an unspoken. <laughs> so, but I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll, we'll, we'll call for Miss Diane's unspoken now, and we'll give you an unspoken later even. So we'll give you two unspokens. Yes, ma'am. Apprehensive. Good word, apprehensive about all this, and I just pray that they... There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that they love you as much as we do. So, yes. Yes. Pray for uh, Miss Robbie. Is, has some uh, new family experiences going on, and so that was a blessing. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Ah. Uh, It's a big deal. Sure. So pray for Miss Emily. Um, she's at that stage where her hair is falling out. and So just pray for her, for her confidence and her strength and, and, uh, just for, and for the procedures that she's continuing to go through and for her healing. I was praying for her this morning. So, and, and for the Kirks and for her husband and for her, all of her family as they go through what they're going through. Uh, anyone else? Amen. Any other unspoken prayer requests? And I know we have lots of stuff going on in our lives and families and heart hurts and and um, opportunities. That's what they are. 
difficulties for the believer, uh, they are opportunities for us to go through things the way the Lord wants us to go through them. So um, we will do that together. So let's go, Lord, in prayer together. Lord God, tonight we just uh, love you. Lord, uh, we see you, uh, Lord, with our hearts high and lifted up. Lord, trained, filling the temple. Lord, being praised. And, and uh, Lord, in our hearts tonight, we just say, worthy are you. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. And Lord God, we lift up these, uh, these prayer requests to you, Lord, especially Emily, Lord, and, and um, Lord, no doubt the reality of those treatments and that condition, um, Lord, starting to set in. Uh, we just pray, Lord, for her strength and her family. And, and Lord, we pray for, um, Lord, just so many situations and circumstances, um, so many relationship things that people are going through. Um, Lord, so many heart hurts that people have. Lord God, we just ask you, Lord, just to be the answer, the living God, Lord, who gives us perspective and strength and healing where necessary. Lord, um, um, things like Miss Robbie and, and the, the new relationships that, uh, Lord, are opening up and have opened up in her, in her family. And um, Lord, just uh, we praise you for the victories, Lord, for, um, uh, for Stacy's uh, mom and, and the, the wonderful work that you've done there. And we pray for continued strength and healing. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done, Lord, all that you can do and will do, all that you're doing here. In the church, we're praying for wisdom and, and guidance, Lord, that you would just help us, Lord, to be a holy people, a, a people, Lord, who identify um, sin in our own life, Lord, that we repent and that we, um, Lord, put ourselves in the position to be used by you, Lord, uh, to hear from you, Lord, to um, be effective for you in this world. We pray, Lord God, that you just have your will and way. Use us as you see fit. Lord, guide us in your word tonight, we ask in your precious name. Amen. Uh, so tonight we are we're picking back up in Exodus where we were. We kind of recapped Exodus 1 through Exodus chapter number 20 last week. And we basically see a covenant people and how that God made covenant with his people. And I want to kind of touch on the idea of a covenant people tonight. And by the way, we are a covenant people. That's what salvation is. Salvation is where God fulfilled his covenant um, with all nations of all the earth. And, and that final consummation of that covenant, that promised one that was promised in Genesis chapter number 3, where the, that seed of David now sits on eternal throne, having paid the eternal price. And now there's this brand new kingdom. Um, but this, this covenant people, the answer that God has always had, the one common thread throughout Scripture is that God desires and designed a people for himself. And so when God first designed the people in the Garden of Eden, we see that God had this, uh, this personal relationship. And when, when man sins, when mankind falls in sin, God makes covenant with man by doing what? He kills this animal, he covers man's sin, and he makes the first covenant, which is what? One day, through the seed of woman, let that sink in, because of the virgin birth one day, through this seed of the woman, there will be a child born who will bruise the head of that serpent who tempted you to sin, the first covenant promise. And then we see the next covenant promise in Noah where there's this flood because why? Because man once again um, uh, turned his back on God and, and, uh, and so God um, destroys, God comes in judgment. We were talking about uh, Revelation the other day and we were talking about judgment and, and, um, and, I, and I was telling somebody, I said, God has come in judgment. I know, but I mean destroying the whole world. He did. <laughs> he destroyed the whole world and uh, at, at one time already. And so um, he's going to destroy the whole world again. But he destroyed this, this world 
uh, one time. And then after that, he made a covenant with Noah. And the covenant was what? This rainbow in the sky that said, I won't destroy man again with water. And I won't curse the ground like that again because he said one of the reasons why is I'd have to do it all the time because man's heart is so wicked. And so he makes this covenant. And then just a couple chapters later, you see someone named Adam. I mean Abraham. And Abraham, God made this covenant. And what was the covenant? I'm going to make of you a great nation. There was two parts to the Abrahamic covenant. And it was what? I'm going to make of you a great nation. And by you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Right? It was a two-part covenant. That covenant had to do with there's going to be this nation of people that are going to be my people and I'm going to be their God. That's kind of where we are right now. And through those people, everybody, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Man, I think that is so important to understand that the the children of Israel and the children of God... um, Today, all nations, all uh, the entire world, these two people are directly connected today. And so that, 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 that was the covenant. Um, then you have this, uh, this covenant with David in 2 Samuel chapter number 7. What was the covenant made with David? So said, David, one day there's going to be one that sits on your throne. So there will be somebody from your line on the throne forever. And so if you read uh, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, what you see is you see even when there was a division between uh, Judah and Israel, what you see is the line of David, there's always somebody from his, from his family on that throne. Even so when, uh, when the nation of Israel was conquered, when Jesus comes, if you read in the book of Matthew, you see the genealogy. Why do you think that genealogy is in there and David's in there? Because it's showing that, that remember the, what I, the promise I made David in 2 Samuel chapter number 7 and 2 Chronicles about there being a king who's going to sit on that throne. Remember the promise I made in Genesis chapter number 3 where one day the seed of the woman was going to sit supreme and bruise the head of that serpent. Here we go. So now we have this New Testament or what? New Covenant. So there's always this covenant. And so I wonder if you would to look at uh, Exodus chapter number 19 and verse number 4. Exodus chapter 19, verse number 4. Because what we're going to do in, um, in the book of Exodus, when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, God is going to do this again. He's going to give a covenant. Um, this is what we call a conditional covenant. But what is a covenant? A covenant is God saying, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I have the power to do it. I have this, I'm, I'm making this, um, this promise. I'm, I'm making this, um, um, this partnership with man. It's more than cross your heart, hope to die, stick a needle in your eye. It's I'm God and I don't change. And so if I tell you I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So look at Exodus chapter number 4 and verse number 6. Because, or, excuse me, Exodus 19, verse number 4. Wow. Exodus 19, verse number 4. I promise that is the verse as far as I understand. The Bible says, You have seen what I did to Egypt and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, you, um, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people Um, For all the earth is mine. Verse number 6. And ye shall be, I love this word, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. There are are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So I want you to speak these words to the children of Israel. This is my covenant with them. That if they'll keep my commandments, this conditional covenant, Where he says, if you'll keep my commandments, you'll be a peculiar people to me. A holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Can anybody think in the book of Revelation um, what we're called a kingdom of? Sir? Priests and? Two things. Kings and priests. We're called kings and priests. 
in maybe two weeks, we're going to do a start a, a, a Sunday uh, deal on uh, a war of two kingdoms. How that we are in a kingdom today, and that you and I, if you are born again, you are a king and priest in this kingdom. You are an overcomer in this kingdom, the kingdom of God that has already come. The kingdom of God came when what happened? When Jesus Christ came. Remember John, the voice of one crying in the wilderness? Prepare. Because why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's like, hey, oh, it is here. I will not do it. So, um, so we see these, these covenants. And this, this is a covenant to these people to God's people, to these Jewish people, to this Jewish nation, which if you'll keep my commandments, the commandments that I'm giving you right now, you're going to be a peculiar, holy, set-apart nation of priests to me. And there were three parts of these commandments. The three parts of the commandments um, were, uh, first of all, and we talked about these already, Exodus chapter number 19 and Exodus chapter number 20. It's what we call the Decalogue or the Ten Words the Ten Commandments. That covered the moral law or the law between man and his relationship with God. It was basically the Ten Commandments still kind of, uh, they, not kind of, they still relate to us today because they have to do with man and God. It's like if you're going to have a relationship with me, you need to know how to approach me. Right? With a police officer, you don't go to say, you don't walk up to a police officer and say, hey, cool gun, let me see it. That's how you get maced for no good reason. You need to know how to approach somebody. I didn't walk up to my dad and say, hey, old man. To this day, I wouldn't do it. Right? You have to know how to approach somebody. And so the same is true with God. This is moral law, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 19 and 20. Discuss how man approaches God, how man has a relationship with the Lord. Then what we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to start talking about tonight, is Exodus chapter 21 through Exodus chapter number 23. That's the civil law. So God is like this. You're going to be a nation of priests, and you need to know how to relate to one another. One of the beautiful things about the civil law, the law that God gave, was that you see how much God loves those he created. It is incredible how much God loves us. He takes care of us. He wants what's best for us and how he looks out for the weakest among us. Um, So you have the civil law, which we'll talk about tonight. And then the majority of the book of Exodus is ceremonial law. It revolves around the temple because... What we'll talk about when we get to it, it's in Exodus chapter number 24 through 31, 36 through 39, and in Leviticus, much of Leviticus, um, you see how that um, the, the entire nation of Israel was this theocracy where it revolved around the temple of God. Everything, their, their laws, their, um, their social order, their... Um, Patterns of living and feasts and everything revolved around this tabernacle that when it moved, they moved. They even lived around the tabernacle. And so um, all that they did was, was revolved around this ceremonial law. And so when it talks about uh, if you touch this, you're unclean. Why, why did it do that? Well, because... They were a nation of priests. They were a nation of people who were holy to the Lord. So like, don't go out there and then touch that dead body and then run up here to this tabernacle. Because there's this ceremonial law, right? Don't eat that owl. <laughs> don't eat whatever kind of bird you want to eat. Don't eat whatever kind of fish you want to eat. Don't eat, don't eat a pig. Don't eat any bacon. Can you imagine? Aren't you glad you're a Gentile today? We were in Israel. I'm like, they, they eat fish for breakfast. I'm like, dude. Five, one day, we, we asked our guy, 
one day was like, where can we get, where can we get, and, and like, like um, they don't eat, in, in Israel, they don't eat cheeseburger. That's outside of the ceremonial law, where the Bible says, don't seethe the meat in its mother's milk. So they consider cheese and meat together a no-no. And so we were like, hey, where can we go get something to eat that we recognize? And they were like, well, King, yeah, no. They said, go to King David Hotel. So one night we went over there, and boy, we were, you should have seen that table. It was like bacon cheeseburgers and, and all of this stuff. And, and so, you know, we're just, we're eating. And, but, but it's these ceremonial laws. Why? Because he's saying, um, do this because you're a, a king, you're a nation of priests, and if you do X, then you are unclean. Unclean meaning what? You're not able to worship like you should. By the way today, your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, there are all these things that prohibit right worship today. We live in a society that just thinks, hey, you know, God will understand. He does not understand. Well, better yet, he does understand. We don't understand. Fact of the matter is, um, um, Augustine said, love God and do as you please. He said, that'll work. Love God and do as you please. Because if you love God, doing what he pleases is what you'll please. Love God and then do as you please. <laughs> because loving God changes what you please. That's how it works. But you don't, you, don't, you don't just do whatever you want to do and then run up and like, you know, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, are you, are you talking to me? Right? We've all experienced that in relationships. Doing somebody wrong and then going up to them like nothing's wrong. And they're like, wait, what? We, we need to clear some things up. So everything in this ceremonial law had to do with how they approached worship. Because their whole life was supposed to be an act of worship. Anyway, we're not talking about that tonight. We're talking about civil law. How the children of Israel were to react and treat one another. Because, by the way, that is important. When Jesus was asked, um, what is the most important commandment? Because the Pharisees and Sadducees, boy, they were big on the commandments. There's a commandment for every part of the body, a commandment for every day of the year, um, 613 commandments. Uh, when I was over in Israel, the, the command, they were talking about the commandments. They said, you know how many, how many um, um, seeds are in a pomegranate? You'll see in the, t in the tabernacle, they had a, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate around the, the high priest's garment that would ring when he walked. So you know how many seeds are in a pomegranate? 613. I'm like, who counts pomegranate seeds? He said, one for every law. One for every Old Testament law. And I have, as of yet, never counted the pomegranate seeds. I'm just going to have to take the man's word for it. But he said, God knew what he's doing when he gave the laws, and he was telling about all the laws and, and all this stuff. These ceremonial, or rather civil laws, there's something to be said, but when Jesus was asked, what was the greatest law? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love other people. How we treat other people. It was the second thing. He said, first, how you treat and approach me is number one. The second thing is how you treat and approach other people. We'll talk about worship after that, but if we don't have those two things in line, we have a problem. So we begin um, in this at uh, Exodus chapter number 21. So if you're turning your Bibles to Exodus chapter number 21, we will get started. <coughs> and we'll probably uh, only be able to finish number one tonight, but let's look at um, just a couple uh, of the divisions, and there are more than that uh, in the civil law, but yielding our conduct. When it comes to the moral law, the civil law, and uh, the ceremonial law, it all really amounts to us yielding to God. The Christian life really amounts to that. 
whether or not I'm willing to yield my free will to Almighty God. God could have just as easily said, you are going to serve me. He could have created you and said, this is how it's going to be. There's not a choice. The problem with that is he already did that. The angels already do that. They don't have a choice, which is why the devil and his angels have no chance of salvation and redemption. They have that heavenly experience, that heavenly position. The fall was their choice. You don't get a choice. However, if you're going to love somebody, you have to have a choice. You see, if June the 9th, 1989, I just grabbed Rachel by the hair and drug her to my cave, that's not love, that's compulsion. God said, I loved you so much, and I'm, I am love, and I show love, and I'm looking for people to love me. You see, having the opportunities to reject God because of, of all the time you have and all the money you have and all the opportunities to do other things, it's the great, greatest opportunity to love the Lord ever. For example, I heard uh, about a guy the other day, and he said, um, you know, I was really had this conflict with my... Um, kids playing softball and uh, because they want to play these tournaments on Sunday he said so I put a team together and so now we play softball tournaments but when it comes to Sunday we just don't play he said um, and we have a really good team and we were in Shreveport this last week I was talking to him and he said so on Saturday evening we were playing the game that would put us in the semifinals and so we had to tell them that hey um, Coach and, re, uh, and uh, umpire, we need to talk to y'all real quick. Um, we're going to play this next inning, and then we're forfeiting this game. So what do you mean? You're, you're way ahead. I know, but we don't play on Sunday. And, and they're like, what do you mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? We enjoyed it. We played last night and today. We had a good time. We're going to go ahead and give you all the win, and we're not playing tomorrow. We're going to church tomorrow. And, the, and uh, the other team was like, what kind of trick is this? We need you to sign this paper in front of all these people. I'm like, okay, whatever. And they were like, what church do you go to? What, where are you from? What denomination are you? The umpire was asking. People were asking. People was wondering. And I told him, I said, you will never preach a louder sermon than that one right there. You'll never preach a louder sermon. Why? Because when you say... That this, I'm yielding what I would, would really rather do to a God that's just bigger. Then, then and, and people are, when you do that in your life, when you yield whatever it is in your life to Almighty God and your family sees it. I told you the story one time about uh, a family member, Rachel and ours, and, and we were struggling financially, and, and they were talking about it. Of course, I, I had no intention of talking to Rachel's family about it, but uh, they said uh, when Rachel told them that our biggest bill was our commitment to the Lord, they were just shocked. And they said, well, just take the amount of time that you work at the church, multiply it by minimum wage, deduct it from your tithe. I'm like, no. And if I could just see how God is blessed and what he's done. But, but it's because it, tithe or time or whatever it is you do in your life, recreation or whatever, it's only about yielding. How you treat somebody else, only about yielding. Your relationship with the Lord is about submitting. In Ephesians chapter number 5, when you do marriage counseling, the one thing everybody hates to get to is Ephesians chapter number 5, the submission. I've even had people say, Brother Tony, if you're fixing to tell me why I submit yourself to your husband, skip it. I'm like, oh, okay. But you're missing the best part. Because Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 1, begins like this. 
Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Everything good that God created starts with submission. It starts with, I don't have to do this my way. So this is what's so amazing about God's law. So amazing about God's law is that it has to do with, okay, Lord, this is what you said do. I like bacon. I'm not eating it. If you say don't do it, I just won't do it. If you say this is for my good, I'll take your word for it. So let's look at this just yielding in our conduct toward one another and what it is. Uh, to what this is as far as one another. First of all, um, why not? I did. Okay, well, uh, fortunately, you have a piece of paper. That's not it. You have a piece of paper, and I have this, like, Linus to hold on to. Number one, yielding our conduct, first of all, concerning, uh, concerning the servitude of others. Now, um, we hear people say, well, there were slaves in the Bible, and they try to make, you know, God and the church and the Bible look bad. I want you to, if you would, look. Now, um, there are a couple things about that. Number one, um, this was a form of um, indentured servitude. And um, where people could actually pay off debts, they could, um, they could um, uh, make money for certain things. They could even, for their kids, who they weren't able to take care of, they were able to help their kids in this way. Um, and uh, so this was actually a benefit to their culture. Also understand, number two, that slavery was in, at this time a norm, not an exception. It was the rule. So what God does is he makes an exception to their rule with these rules. So he's saying, I want, you to, I want, I want to tell you something about how you're treating people. This is beautiful. Listen to what it says. Verse number one. Um. Now these are the judgments, or the rules, which thou shalt set before them. If thou bind Hebrew servant, now notice this is within your own people. If you bind Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh years he shall go free for nothing. Okay, that's the number of, this is not a permanent thing. In other words, this is something, this person's in financial trouble, they're in whatever the situation is, they're trying to make money, they're trying to get back on their feet, whatever it is. This is something you do. This is six years, and the seventh year, um, then they go free for nothing. It's not like they owe you anything. They're, they're, they are paid off. They have paid you whatever they owed you. Um, fact of the matter is, can you think of anybody that... Um, that uh, that bought something for seven years of servitude and even got ripped off and doubled down. Anybody? Oh, Jacob. Right? Jacob said, man, you good looking. I'm going to go talk to your dad about this. How can I marry your daughter? I don't have any money. I don't have a dowry to pay. What can I do? So you can ser serve me for seven years. Remember? Seven years. He's like, Deal. He got old tender eye after seven years. No, ma'am. So, um, so, um, so then, and the Bible said it didn't seem like no time to him, which tells you a little bit about how people were treated, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Verse number three. Um, and if he came by himself, he should go out by himself. And if he were married, um, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife while well, he's there. Now, this is a rule that everybody understood. So if this person comes in, his master says, hey, um, this person over here, she's not married. Uh, do y'all want to get married while you're here in my house? Uh, that was an option. Um, and then there are children born to them. Then the wife and the children will stay with the master, and he'll have to go out by himself. <laughs> 
Okay? That was the rule. And if the servant shall plainly say, listen to what it says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, and I will not go out free. In other words, you see how the relationship can, can be built here? You see how there can be a relationship between people? It's not like what you saw on, uh, on the episode of uh, whatever it was, Kunta Kinte or whatever. Their t- roots, they're tying people to a tree and, and being cruel. They're, you're going to see how they're telling people not to be cruel to one another. If he says, what if he loves his wife and kids and hates his master? Uh, then he has a problem. Don't get married in that seven years. Yes, that, which, hey, this is a great point, right? Now listen to me very carefully. This is important. You say, well, this is not fair. Remember when Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples because this has everything to do with covenant and yielding. I want you to listen to me very carefully because I guarantee you there were people in here that said, that's not fair. Jesus told his disciples, his disciples said, is it right to divorce for any reason? They went through this big, long thing. And here's what his disciples said. Uh, it's not, it's, if that's the rule that I need to submit to, it's good that nobody marry. You know what Jesus said? Well, you're right. Here, man, let me give you a hug. Not what he said. Jesus said, there are some people who are eunuchs on purpose. <laughs> and some are made that by other people. Bum, bum, bum. You know what Jesus is saying? Make your decision. Jesus told his disciples, sound like you got some decisions to make, bro. So you say, well, this man fell in love with this woman. And, and yeah, well, you need to quit watching movies about romances. And start making decisions instead. Understanding that relationship is not based on feelings and candles. It's based on uh, what this relationship is and responsibilities. So thank you for your comment. But if he decides, hey, I love this woman and my children, I want to stay, then he was supposed to go to his uh, master and say plainly that, that, uh, that this is the thing, and his master is supposed to bring him to the judges and tell him that this person wants to stay with him at his house, and he's supposed to go to the doorpost of his house in verse number six, and um, his master is to to um, take an awl and bore a hole through his ear, and he'll serve him there forever. Again, notice this is a decision. Exactly right. It was. Exactly right. Ms. Kristen point, makes a good point. Um, this is the term here is bond servant. You know, if you, you fill out a bond for someone, um, a temporary order for someone, uh, and, the, and the disciples, she pointed out, uh, call themselves bond servants. They are a servant. That's what we are. We are slaves to Christ. We have intentionally, because we love the Lord, gone to that door of the master's house and had our ear borne through and said, Lord, we're spending the rest of our lives with and for you. You tell us what to do. What a decision that is, by the way, to say, hey, I love my master. I'm staying here. Um, I no longer am going to live based on my free will. It's a huge decision. But once the judges have said, now th- you do this, <laughs> Why do you have to go before the judges? I had to go before the judges because this is a legal thing. By the way, so too is salvation. That's why the New Testament uses the term justification. It's where the judge calls you justified. He puts you in a different place. He takes you or redeemed. The, the idea of redemption is that this person is bought back. He is bought from somebody. He is now the possession. So the New Testament Christian would have understood redemption. And I've been bought back with the price. I've been redeemed or I have been, 
um, it would almost be like somebody was kidnapped and somebody paid the ransom price for that person is what, what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So we see, oh, my soul. Concerning the servant, the servitude of others, we are on number one. Um, yeah. So, um, and, and so look at verse number nine. Let's fast forward at least a little bit in number one, uh, 1A. Um, and, if, um, and if he be betrothed, uh, if he betrothed her uh, unto his son, um, uh, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. That is to say that if, um, if someone is, is, uh, is engaged or marries um, uh, a slave, this is so awesome. Listen to what happens. So there's a slave girl comes in, and the, the son of the home says, yes, I, I'm, I, I love this girl. I want to marry this girl, and he marries her. And then the son marries someone else. Here's what the Bible says. And he take another wife, verse number 10. Her food, her raiment, her duty of marriage... That is like in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 5, where the Bible says, do not, um, um, uh, don't, don't deny someone um, uh, sexually, is what he's talking about here, the duty of marriage. In other words, don't marry someone else and then just put this person over to a corner. Uh, none of that stuff shall be diminished. And if he do any of these three unto her, this is talking about the master's son. Then, he, then she shall go out free. She is no longer a servant. You have mistreated her. You have done her wrong. Notice what happens. Even in this thing of slavery, what is God doing? He is protecting his people. He is saying, this person who is a servant, a bond servant, is not to be mistreated. Not male nor female. Don't be trying to mistreat because who do we mistreat? We always mistreat those who can't mistreat us back. You used to always love to see fights at school, right, when you was in school. Nobody ever picked on somebody bigger than them. Well, except for me, but I never want to fight. But it's like... You know, it's just amazing how, how we always want to pick on somebody that's smaller or weaker or disadvantaged. And God was like, listen, we're not doing that. Which is why, by the way, he starts off with how to treat one another with those who are slaves. He said, I know you think that's the weakest among you. I know you feel like that's your weakest group. We're not going to do that. So for 11 verses, verse number 1 through verse number 11, almost as extensively as he speaks on any other thing, he speaks on those who have said, I've fallen on hard times, and I need to go into bond serv servitude. I need help. Because when they do that, do not mistreat those people. Let's see if we can well, at least do one more. Oh, I don't need this. Um, 1B. Concerning murder. Um, verse number 12. The Bible says, He that smiteth a man so that he die, he shall surely be put to death. So um, he's, he's uh, putting first a uh, um, capital punishment on the table. Uh, I had somebody one time say, I'm against capital punishment. It's not a deterrent. I'm like, it's not a deterrent. Is it a deterrent for the one who committed murder? 100% of the time, that person never recommits. Um, so it's a deterrent at least for one person. Um, so here, uh, he says that person who, who, who kills someone, uh, that person will surely be put to death. But he goes into some other things, um, protections here for people. If a man, um, let's go to verse number 15. The Bible says, if he that smiteth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So now we're talking about the importance and sanctity of the home. Notice, he's not talking about even killing somebody now. He said, you smack your mama? Capital offense. 
Why do you think that might have been a capital offense? Right? Leadership is one of them. But as soon as the home deteriorates, society deteriorates. Why is it people are killing one another? It's because they don't have respect for one another. All of that stuff starts at home. Once you, God knows, once you destroy that first institution that he created, which is not government, but was home, then we're done. So you smite father or mother. Yes, sir. This gives brand new insight to that. Uh, yes, sir. That would definitely shorten your life. Um, but not just that, just, just the idea that, that if you don't know how, and especially in this culture, where you're going to find as we uh, eventually get to some of it, you're going to find there's a lot of capital cases. And we in our minds think, well, man, how cruel that is. Well, I want you to think of what happened when, when God says, go into the land of Canaan, and I want you to utterly destroy these nations. Utterly destroy them. Utterly run them out. And you say, man, how cruel. Well, did you notice that as you read through there that the children of Israel did not do it? They didn't obey? Did you notice the results? It was death. Death on a scale that was way bigger than that. God is like, there's this standard. Listen, they can leave, but they can't stay. You need to utterly run them out. Because the opposite of that is them staying then you becoming friends and you rebelling against me. And it's not that God is, is, is you know, he's like, well, you hurt my feelings, so psh. But the opposite of righteousness is your own hurt. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that those who hate wisdom love their own death. It's not, God doesn't punish like you and I punish. God doesn't wait till he's fed up and say, I've had it up to here with you. It's not because he's frustrated. God doesn't get frustrated. God does what he does for your good. For my good. Because why? Because sin, the wages of sin is death. God knows that sin left unchecked is way worse than his punishment, which is why Proverbs says someone that doesn't punish their children does not love their children, which is why the Bible says in the New Testament that those who don't receive chastisement of the Lord are not his children. Who he loves, he corrects. And so we see this idea behind murder says don't, Don't strike your mom or dad. That's a capital offense. Verse number 16. And uh, he that stealeth or kidnaps someone to sell that person. Think of anybody come to mind. Poor old Joseph was thrown in the the pit and sold. Um, Who uh, kidnaps someone and sells them. Or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be Put to death. This idea of concerning murder and, and kidnap and the treatment of others when it comes to violence. It says, do not allow. It. I'll, I'll close with this since it's that time. I can't believe we got through two. Um, but when we were in Israel, we're driving down the road, and I was amazed. We talked about this when we were on the bus. How many kids were out just playing in the road? By themselves. And I'm not talking about preteens. I'm talking about little old kids who didn't hardly know better than not to get in the road. I'm like, there are kids everywhere out here. Where are their mom and daddy? 
And uh, the guy that was, was, was our leader is like, uh, I'm sure they're doing what mom and daddies do. He said, people don't kidnap people over here. <laughs> that ain't a thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. He said, just not a thing. They ain't got to us yet. <laughs> That's not something that we do. These kids are safe, as, a, as safe as if they were in their house. I was like, hey, yo. That's pretty cool. But here, imagine if, if you kidnap somebody, death sentence. Remember how the death sentence happened with Aiken and his family? It wasn't like, you know, after 14 appeals and 30 years in prison, then we'll think about whether or not you still get the death penalty. It's like carry him outside and y'all stone him. Anyway, it was for the good of one another. Which is another point. Sometimes your good comes at your inconvenience and your hurt. We call that, when I talk to people sometimes, addition by subtraction. That's what happens when your doctor says, no more salt for you, only Mrs. Dash. He says, addition by subtraction. Any thoughts or questions? Please say no, I'm running late. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, for, 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 for creating a covenant people. Pray, Lord God, that you would have your will and way, God, and direct our lives. We love you. We thank you for your plan for us in your precious name. Amen.